The story follows a wimpy <laughs> high school outcast named Kotaru Tanoji, who lives in Kazumatsuri, a city trying to tackle global warming. Kotaru has a special ability to use magic to enhance his strength and speed. The wimpy <laughs> kid lives out his days trying to fit in, hanging out with his best friend Katori, a sleep-loving odd girl with a penchant for coins, and sleeping in the forest. Kotaru's life takes a dramatic turn when a <laughs> red ribbon-clad ghost girl, Kagari, starts haunting him, and he gets drawn into a whimsical world. To solve his ghost problem, Kotaru goes to a self-centered witch and president of the occult research club, Akane, who claims not to believe in the supernatural, and spends most of her time gaming. He also enlists the help of a dumb, clumsy transfer student, Chihaya, a stuck-up class rep with major OCD, Lucia, who always ends up kicking his arse, and a two-colored eye girl, Shizuru. Together, they discover hidden secrets about themselves and go on a roller coaster journey in an attempt to save the world. One day, Kotaru wakes up and casually strolls through a dystopian city overrun by forests. He appears to be the only one in the city, with his thoughts keeping him company. Suddenly, he runs into a weird red ribbon clad girl, Kagari, under a huge tree. He attempts to help her, however, the girl uses her ribbon to rip out the poor guy's heart, fatally wounding him. Kotaru wakes up with a scream, relieved that it was just a dream, and starts with his daydream dreaming wondering if the girl may be a lover from his past life. Kotori's mother interrupts his thoughts and pleads with him to help her find Katori and bring her back home. He leaves immediately and wanders into the forest to search for Katori, wondering why she is still attached to the forest. He runs into a weird-looking dog that startles the living hell out of him. Kotaru found Katori deep asleep. After trying to wake her up to no avail, he used her favorite thing in the world, coins, to draw her back home while she sleepwalked. Katori wakes up shocked and wondering how she got home. She thanks Kotaru for helping her and tells him that she dreamt about coins pouring out from the vending machine. They bid each other farewell, and Kotaru walks home with an eerie feeling of being watched. Back home, he hurriedly buries himself under a blanket to sleep. Later on, the pervy red ribbon ghost sneaks into his room and starts sucking on his arm. Kotaru jumps out of bed, thinking it was just a bad dream. He faints as soon as he sees the mark on his arm with her mouth juices dripping from it. The following morning, Kotaru goes to school alone, because Katori somehow overslept again. In school, he goes to disturb the class delinquent emo kid, Yoshino, who gives him a death glare instead. Kotaru lives in Delulu land and hopes that he can one day make Yoshino his friend. However, Yoshino hates his guts and tries to hit him for not showing up for their arranged duel. Kotaru remembers boasting and accepting the challenge. He playfully apologizes for not showing up, which pisses Yoshino even more as he tries to hit Kotaru. They are interrupted by the angry class rep, Lucia. She is still fuming red with anger and their homeroom teacher Nishikuju interrupts them. Kotori finally makes it to class after the first period is over. Yoshino tries to intimidate Kotaru again, nevertheless. Kotaru continues to make fun of him instead, which enrages Yoshino even more. Kotori meets up with the duo and joins Kotaro to tease Yoshino. Kotaru, Yoshino, and Kotori are all class outcasts. Even though Kotaru is a bit more chatty with his classmates, however, he never fits in with the crowd. That's why he tries to befriend Yoshino and hopes the three of them can hang out together. Late that night, Kotaru found the pervy ghost girl once again sucking on his arm, causing him to pass out again. The following morning, on his way to school, while inspecting the bite mark, he realizes she is the same girl from his dreams and thinks he must be cursed. Suddenly, he trips on a box in the middle of the road and sees a clumsy transfer student, Chihaya, stuck up in a tree. Kotaru tries to help her, but she is worried that he might be a perv, and she is right. He manages to help her down the tree, Chihaya thanks him and gives a funny narration that absolutely makes no sense about how she got stuck in the tree. A wimpy Kotaro tries to help her with the box and almost rats his pants. He is shocked when she picks up the box like a feather. His ego gets the best of him, and he tries to redeem himself by dragging the box with her, making her trip and fall, and raising her skirt. Instead of helping or saying sorry, he goes full-on pervy about it, and embarrassed Chihaya quickly picks up her box, informs him of her newfound hatred for him, and then runs away. Kotaru shrugs it off and walks to class, relieved that he doesn't have to see her again since they'll probably not be in the same class. Unfortunately for him, Chihaya ends up in the same class with him and even ends up sitting next to him. After introducing herself, the pervy class boys go wild, screaming at the top of their lungs. While the teacher informs them about the Harvest Fiesta, Kotaru tries to talk to Chihaya, but she overreacts and almost smashes his head in. He apologizes to her, and she also reminds him that her hatred for him is still very valid. Later on, Kotaru runs into a patch-eyed hall monitor, Shizuru, who somehow forgot how to operate a whistle. He offered to help her check it, but she first ran into the restroom to rinse it out before handing it over. He fixes it and hands it back, after thanking him. Shizuru still gives him a warning for running in the hallway, and as punishment, she asks him to eat with her later. Kotaru promises that they can eat together next time since he already had lunch. Kotaru finds a nosy Inoue, head of the newspaper club, writing about him in her memo. She quickly accuses him of bribing and nepotism, and starts an impromptu interview, twisting his every word against him. 
Inoue leaves after threatening to expose him. He picks up a piece of paper that dropped from her memo and sees the names of her targets, including himself. After school, Kotaru tries to talk to Chihaya, but she starts shouting at him. She calms down after he offers to show her around town. She apologizes for acting out, but somehow the silly Kotaru still ends up making her pissed again, so she leaves. Chihaya goes to some dodgy part of the school to meet the self-acclaimed gamer witch, Akani, and they exchange some very dodgy words, with Akani acting like some evil boss. The following morning, Kotaru comes to school looking like a zombie. He can't sleep because of his pervy ghost problem. Katori tells him about a rumored witch with supernatural powers in the school who never comes to class but somehow always advances to the next level. He enlists Katori's help to help him search for the witch. After school, the duo tries to enlist Yoshino as their muscle, but he refuses to have any part in their little adventure, so they set out on their own. After spending all day asking around, they came up empty-handed with no clue on how to locate the witch. Suddenly, they're interrupted by the class information peddler, who hands them a book to help with their quest. With the help of the book, the duo stumbles upon a spooky room in school that makes scary noises when they try to hit a light switch. Chihaya finally turns on the light, and they find a luxurious room that seems related to the occult research club. They find it empty, and decide to leave a note. That night, the pervy red ribbon ghost girl comes to visit, but this time she locks the doors and even puts up a magic barrier, so Kotaru has nowhere to run to. He bangs on the door, screaming for help, and the girl disappears once he mentions Katori's name. Hmm, weird, right? Well, once again, wimpy Kotaru passes out. The next morning, he goes back to the luxurious room and finds a death note that scared daylight out of him. He also finds a weird questionnaire, which he fills out. On his way out, he runs into a now calm Chihaya. Katori also joins them and he introduces the duo. The two ladies have a very awkward but friendly exchange, and Katori asks Kotaru to show Chihaya around town, which he accepts. He happily drives her around town as they talk about why she moved to Kazumatsuri, and for the final tour, he showed her the Martel Group's Japanese headquarters, a famous international environmental group. They decided to call it a day since the sun was already setting, and he bid her farewell as they parted. Kotaru receives a text from the witch, so he returns back to school that night. The witch sent him on a stupid wild goose chase from one classroom to another. As he sat down to drink his canned coffee, the red ribbon ghost girl appeared, which triggered some memories in his head. He ran away, but she kept chasing him and playing tricks with his mind. Suddenly, some weird minion-looking monsters pop out and start running towards him. Kotaru decides to rest while sipping his coffee, but she appears again, so he throws it at her and runs off. Soon afterward, he runs into a metal door and goes inside, but it locks him in. A spooky figure flies over him, but as soon as he tries to rewrite his speed using magic, it attacks him. Kotaru hits the flying figure to the ground and sees a chubby-looking Tinkerbell demon, Gil. Gil gets up and tries to suck Kotaru's blood but is kicked in the nuts by Pawnee, a cute-looking tiny demon that reprimands him for acting up. She apologizes to Kotaru and tells him that they can survive on plants and water, but sucking blood is Gil's favorite pastime. Well, stupid Kotaru decides to give him a little drop of blood, but the greedy chubby demon latches on, refusing to let go. After fighting the bloodsucker off, Kotaru follows the dumb demons through a forest so they can show him the way out but they lead him right into the nest of a giant monster. They try to quietly leave the nest, but the fat bloodsucker Gil sneezes and wakes the monster up. They try to outrun it, but it hits Kotaro to the ground. The pervy the ghost girl appears in front of him, still gloriously ravishing the canned coffee. Kotaru quickly jumps in to save her, but all that matters to her is the poor coffee she just lost. As the monster goes in for the final kill, the red ribbon ghost swiftly slashes its tentacles into sushi with her red ribbon. During the fierce battle, the supernatural dimension starts to collapse. As she bursts the head of the monster that looks like a ripe puss with her ribbon, the space is rocked by the explosion. Kotaru falls through the cracks and somehow lands back into the school, but he can't find the tiny blood-sucking dum-dums. Kotaru found a mannequin with instructions from the witch, so he went back to the luxurious room, where he found a hood-covered Akane in the dark with a glowing ball acting like a real witch. Akane tries to come off as mysterious but is disappointed when she notices that Kotaru is not impressed. After narrating his ordeal to her, he is shocked that she seems uninterested and continues her PC game. Akane tells him that he is f and also doesn't believe him. She discusses his answer to the questionnaire, and promises to give him charms to deal with his ghost problem. Kotaru screams in disbelief when she hands him a paperclip as a charm, and then gives him three paper talismans. She also says he must join the occult research club. Later that night, stupid pervy Kotaru dreams of one of his talismans as a beautiful young woman, who promises to protect him, and also asks him out on a date. That night, the red ribbon ghost girl comes into his room but is repelled by one of the talismans, so she spits it out and leaves, letting Kotaru sleep like a baby. The following morning, this crazy boy finds the 
talisman on the floor and weeps for his lost love life. Later on, in school, he goes to check out the room where he found the supernatural dimension, but only sees a dark closet. He goes back to Katori and narrates everything to her, but she warns him that he may end up in an insane asylum if anyone hears his story. Chihaya interrupted them, but he also sounded like a loony bin to her. During lunch, Kotaru decides to save lunch money and tries the cafeteria free coffee that tastes like wastewater. He sees Yoshino and decides to prank him by offering him a tempting cup of parfait, but he secretly pours spicy sauce into it. Yoshino sees right through him, pushes it away, and tells Kotaru to try it first. Unknowingly, Kotaru exchanges it with stuck-up OCD class rep Lucia's parfait. He tries the parfait and realizes his mistake. But weirdly, Lucia is already chugging down the spicy parfait without noticing. He tries to stop her, but she reprimands him, so he snatches it away from her and quickly chugs it down. He immediately turns red like a ripe tomato. Lucia is enraged, and she punches him in the face. Shortly afterward, he sees Shizuru sleeping under a tree and joins her. Once lunchtime is almost over, her alarm wakes her up, and the duo talks for a bit before heading back inside. Back inside, he is surprised to see their class teacher Nishikuju being all playful with Shizuru. Soon afterward, Kotaru goes back to Akane to tell her about the talisman, but she throws his precious love life in a bin. She tells Kotaru that she doesn't believe in the supernatural and only took over the occult club because she wanted the room for herself. Kotaru vows to prove to her that the supernatural exists and decides to join the club. Akane agrees but asks him to count her out. He assures her that superpowers exist but denies it when she asks him to show her his own power and immediately changes the topic. Akane promises to grant him one wish if he proves to her that the supernatural exists. Our pervy-minded hero asks to place his hand on her bosom if he wins. She hurled insults at him but finally agreed to grant his wish. That night, the pervy ghost came for her normal rounds, but this time she was prepared and blocked the talisman. As soon as she got under his cover, Kotaru polluted, a surefire ghost repellent, and the ghost girl ran away for her dear life. The next morning, Kotaru brings Katori on as a new club member and explains why he joined, although he leaves out the pervy request part. However, Akane quickly mentions it. Katori angrily reprimands him, but he quietly convinces her that it is a joke and says that he is only trying to get close to the rich and powerful Akane. Katori agrees to join, so they get to work setting up a blog for the club. Chihaya also comes to see Akane and tells Kotaru that she is already a member of the club. That night, the perverted Kotaru dreamt of placing his hands on Akane's chest, but he woke up shocked to find his hands on the ghost girl's chest. He jumped out of the bed, babbling, and the girl disappeared. The next morning, while Kotaru is giving Akane a back massage, she gives him more ghost-repelling talismans. On his way back to class, he runs into conspiracy theorist news girl, Inoue. She tells him that she is also researching supernatural mysteries in Kazumatsuri and challenges him to compete for the biggest news scoop. Later on, Kotaru enlists Shizuru to join the club. Since she is a junior, she greets the others with so much respect, but Katori and Chihaya ask her to address them casually. Akane reminds Kotaru that she is not interested in socializing or being a part of the group even though she is the club president. Shizuru's loud android phone ringtone almost makes them jump out of their skins. She picks up, but Kotaru playfully tells her what to say without asking who it is, and Shizuru also repeats it to the caller verbatim. Unfortunately for him, the caller is the stuck-up class rep who always kicks his ass. Shizuru explains that Lucia has been her best friend since childhood, Suddenly, the door bursts open, and an angry Lucia attacks him before they can explain to her that the phone call was a joke. She asks why they were gathered, and Kotaru explains the mission of the club, but Akane quickly sabotages him and mentions the pervy wish part. He tries to save himself, but it is too late because Lucia lands him another blow. She tries to convince Shizuru to leave the club, however, Shizuru refuses. Lucia cannot trust Kotaru, so she decides to join the club to look out for her friend. As the girls continue their girl talk, Kotaru looks at them and gets all emotional. He always wanted to be a part of something more, and this group was starting to look like his dream team. He flashes back to how lonely he, Katori, and Yoshino always look in class and promises to bring them all as his friends so they don't waste their youth feeling lonely. He steps away to join the group, and we see the red ribbon ghost girl almost grabbing him. As they discuss club details, Katori looks outside and sees the ghost girl lurking outside before disappearing. Katori is now starting to look suspicious. The next morning, Kotaru happily takes in the scenery at home and excitedly checks out his talismans. Later in school, during assembly, Kotori addresses the students on the preparations for the Harvest Fiesta. After the assembly, Kotaru tries to get Yoshino to hang out with him, but the school emo delinquent shouts at him and walks away. Kotaru goes to the club room to check on the blog, but runs into Sakuya, a young man who works for Chihaya as a butler and acts like he owns the place. This annoys Kotaru. Akane interrupts their macho show and asks Sakuya why he is wearing their school uniform. He explains that Chihaya mistakenly entered his measurements when she was placing the order, and that is why she still has to wear her old uniform to school. Chihaya 
interrupts them, and Sakuya tells her that he came to deliver her lunchbox. Kotaro introduces himself, and Sakuya also introduces himself as Chihaya's big brother, although the duo are not related by blood. He dashingly calls himself her knight in shining armor, but Kotaro refers to him as a glorified butler. Sakuya continues to shower Chihaya with praise, but Kotaro interrupts him. Sakuya turns to face him angrily and tries to intimidate him, but Kotaro doesn't budge. The school bell rings, and Akani tells them to leave so she can take a nap. Kotaro is shocked and tells her to at least pretend to attend class. Akani boasts that her dark magic can change her class attendance. On his way out, Kotaro boldly calls out to Chihaya in an attempt to make Sakuya jealous. Sakuya calmly makes fun of his name, calling him an idiotaru. Back in class, Kotaro wonders why Chihaya has a butler, and concludes that she must be from a high class. The teacher calls on Lucia to solve a math problem. Kotaru asks Yoshino if he knows why she always wears gloves. Yoshino says she is just a neat freak, however, Kotaru believes there must be more to it than just OCD. He gets all dramatic and tells him that the gloves must contain her witchy cursed powers, but he only ends up scaring poor Yoshino with his crazy imaginative conspiracy theory. The two stupid fools get carried away in their Delulu land, forgetting that they were in class, and start screaming. They come to their senses when the teacher shouts at them to stop. Back in the club room, Kotaru seriously prepares their club activity, while the others stuff their faces with delicacies, thanks to Sakuya. As a stickler for rules, Lucia feels that Sakuya should not be there. Akane proudly assures her that the club room cannot be controlled by the school. Sakuya quickly offers Lucia a tempting cup of fruit parfait to win her over. Kotaru starts throwing tantrums because he is the only one taking the club activities seriously. Next up for their first club activity, the group receives information from the students through their blog about sighting a supernatural snake on campus. Kotaru is so excited as his pervy mind thinks about the reward he was promised. The group set out looking for the supernatural snake, mistakenly. Kotaru placed his hand under Lucia's skirt and won himself his normal daily dose of beating. Still crying in pain, Kotori sees the snake, and Kotaru springs up and chases after it. Chihaya swiftly catches the creature, which turns out to be a cute armadillo. It almost gets away, but she musters all her strength and pulls it in. They are surprised to find a woman also tugging on the snake. The woman is a clerk who just wants the bounty for the snake, so she can make herself a baddie. They all realize that the snake story was not real, and concluded their first club investigation. Later on, Kotaru gets his lunch and sees Shizuru preparing to eat in the courtyard. He remembers the promise he made and decides to join her for lunch. He asks her about her lunch. Shizuru tries to give him a taste but can't bring herself to, so she apologizes to him, and he watches her as she happily eats her canned fish. Soon afterward, her patch-covered eye begins to itch. Kotaru thinks she has an eye infection, but she assures him that it is not. Shizuru makes him promise to keep her secret. She opens the patch to reveal her other eye, which is a different color from the other one. She is surprised and shy when Kotaru assures her that she has beautiful eyes. After lunch, Kotaru, unfortunately, throws a steel tin into the aluminum tin basket and gets schooled on recycling by an angry Lucia. After schooling him, she puts him to work on disposing of other tins as payback for touching her inappropriately earlier. After he finishes, she continues to teach him about recycling and how important it is to the planet. Kotaru wonders why she is so invested in the environment. Leisha realizes that she is geeking out and stops talking. Kotaru teases her and finally gets himself kicked in the balls, landing him in the school clinic. Later that night, on his way home from the clinic, Kotaru sees a huge dog chasing the red ribbon ghost. He quickly follows them in an attempt to rescue her. He rewrites his speed with magic to help him run faster. On his way, he remembers his discussion with Akani and wishes he had shown her his power and gotten his wish granted on the spot. He stops to increase his speed, but notices that the area around him has become eerily quiet. Just then, a hooded lizard-looking fellow with funny teeth, Midu, appears behind behind him, smiling like a maniac. The maniac uses dark magic to conjure up another big dog monster that tries to attack Kotaru, but he quickly runs for his dear life. The dog chased him for a while, but he got away however, when Kotaru tried to rest, it caught up with him. Kotaru crawled out of a cave but landed on a cliff and got bitten by the demon dog. A dark figure killed the monster and saved Kotaru before he was killed. Later on, Kotaru wakes up in a pop-up tent, while the men who saved him are talking about demons. The men tell him that he was found passed out in the park. Kotaru tells them all about the dog demon, and the man who looks like a palm wine tapper boasts about being a demon slayer. The men introduce themselves as online game players, who often confuse games with reality. Kotaru is disappointed that he just met a bunch of old losers. Although the well-dressed gentleman Asaka looks suspicious and way too overdressed to be a gamer, he invites Kotaru to come to his store for pictures of weird animals captured in town. As they continue to discuss, Shizuru, who happens to be a regular at the tent, walks in and is shocked to find Kotaru there. 
He tells her about his ordeal and shows her his wound, but it immediately mysteriously disappears. She tells him that he must have been dreaming. More regular customers arrive at the tent and start bugging Kotaru and Shizuru. Later that night, he dropped Shizuru off at her house before heading home. On his way back, he felt bad for her because she lived alone in a rundown apartment. He also runs into Sakuya, and the duo starts bickering and insulting each other. Kotaru asks him if he offended him since it seems like Sakuya is out to get him. The glorified butler gives him a cryptic response and tells him that they are enemies by fate. The next morning, Shizuru dreams about her parents, and it makes her sad. She opens her eyes and sees Kotaru, who offers to join her for lunch in her favorite spot. Later on, in the club room, he excitedly informs Akani that he found a man with proof of supernatural existence. She tells him that he is only excited because of his perverted wish. The group followed Kotaru to the spot where he met the men last night, but the tent was gone, and somehow the stupid boy forgot to collect a business card from Asaka. Katori informs them that pop bars only come out at night. He tries to call Shizuru since she is a regular, but her phone is turned off. Since it was a waste of time, the girls decided to leave. Meanwhile, Kotaru wanders around looking for Asaka's antique shop and bumps into a red-headed young man, Imamiya, who seems to know Kotaru. The young man warns him about thugs in the area before leaving. Shortly after Kotaru runs into the thugs, the leader of the group, an eggplant-looking fellow, tries to intimidate him, but realizes that Kotaru goes to the same school as Yoshino the king of the slums. The slums used to be overrun by drugs and violence until Yoshino beat them up into change. Kotaru tells the eggplant-looking guy that he is best buddies with Yoshino, so the guy finds information on the store for him. When Kotaru learns that he is older than the eggplant guy, he decides to intimidate him. It works, and the gang leads him to the antique store. Esika welcomes him and apologizes for not giving him his business card. Kotaru also sees Shizuru in the store eating, and he reprimands her for not picking up her phone. Esika asks how the duo met, and Kotaru tells him that he met her in the school hallway on the way to a committee meeting. Esika gives him the photos he promised earlier, but they are all taken out of focus and look nothing like the monsters he has encountered. On their way out, Kotaru thanks him for his help, but gets embarrassed when Shizuru mentions that his goal is Akani's bosom. Asaka gives him his business card, and then jokingly demands 5 million, he also weirds them out with his very unfunny joke. On their way back, Shizuru stops to buy snacks and a CD at a second-hand store. At the club room, Kotaru excitedly shows her the blurred photos and pleads with her to help him investigate, but she refuses. Shizuru shows them the CD she bought containing Nishikuju, their homeroom teacher's favorite songs, and she tells them that she doesn't have a CD player. Chihaya asks her to buy one, but Kotaru, knowing Shizuru's situation, tells Chihaya to buy it for her since she is very rich, but Chihaya is not happy about it. Sakuya informs Kotaru that his master lives on a monthly allowance, even though her family is rich. Kotaru remembers that he has a spare player at home, so Shizuru follows him home to get it. Back home, he gives her his player, and they talk about his dark days when he never listened to his parents and used the player to block out their nagging. During class the following morning, Kotaru thinks about the Red Ribbon Ghost and is glad that the talismans have been keeping her away. However, he is also disturbed as he remembers the summoner who sent the monster dog after him. Suddenly the door to the classroom flings open, scaring everyone, and the Red Ribbon Ghost Girl walks into their class, but only Kotaru can see her. She walks up to him and starts sucking on his arm. He holds his mouth to stop himself from screaming. Yoshino wondered why Kotaru was making creepy noises, and Katori also had a suspicious look on her face. After she is done, the Red Ribbon Ghost Girl flings the back door open and walks out of his class. Once the class is over, he runs to show Akani the bite mark and asks her to deploy talismans in school. Shizuru stops him and asks if he could accompany her somewhere, and he agrees to go with her. Nishikuju, the homeroom teacher, picks them up with her car. Kotaru asks about her relationship with Shizuru, she tells him not to be nosy. Nishikuju informs him that they are going to the home where Shizuru was born. She drops them off at their destination and bids them farewell. Shizuru leads him to a house with roses. They find the house empty and decide to wait. After a while, a beautiful woman walks up to them and asks Shizuru if they have met before, but she says no. Kotaru tries to talk to the lady, but she stops him. Shizuru commends her for planting the roses, but the woman does not remember when she planted them. Her husband soon joins them. Shizuru gets emotional and quickly drags Kotaru to leave, but stops when a little girl, Shizuka, runs out of the house to welcome her parents. As the duo leaves, Shizuru tells him that the people he just met are her family. However, they don't remember her because she accidentally wiped herself from their memory. To demonstrate, she wiped her name from Kotaru's memory and asked him to say her name, but he did not remember. She was surprised when he remembered her name after a few seconds. On their way back, she tells him about her powers. Shizuru's family was poor, 
but they lived happily. They always had grilled fish, which is why it was her favorite. She planted the roses with her mom when she was young. One day, they went to the harvest fiesta, and her father showed them a new house that they would be moving into. Shortly afterward, a monster attack burned down the new house and wounded her mom and dad. One of her eyes was also damaged in the attack, and that was when Shizuru first used her magic to heal them before passing out. Fortunately, some soldiers found and rescued her family. During surgery, Shizuru's damaged eye mysteriously healed itself and changed to a different color. Her family tried to stay happy after the incident. However, she was bullied because of her eye color, and the sight of fire gave her mom severe PTSD, so they stopped grilling fish. One day, a strange man from a company that helped superhumans came to visit them and offered her parents a lot of money to allow Shizuru to join them. She agreed to follow them so that her parents could use the money to be happy again. One weekend, Shizuru came home and found her parents fighting. Her parents had changed from being kind to drunk and even hitting each other. She blamed herself, lost control, and wiped all traces of herself and the past from their minds. Kotaru asks if they can be cured, and she tells him that the extent of the damage done to her parents is irreversible. She then thanked him for accompanying her to see her parents. On the car ride back, the class teacher Nishikuju tells Kotaru that she is associated with the institution that sponsors Shizuru and asks him not to poke any further. Kotaru also realizes that Shizuru was the one who healed him in the pop-up tent. He is also shocked when the teacher informs him that Shizuru has a lot of money in her account and is saving it to buy a house. Kotaru tells her that he is glad he learned a lot about his friend today. Shortly after they drop him off at home, and he wakes Shizuru to tell her goodbye. The following morning at school, Lucia gets into an argument with some boys because she refuses to help them throw their ball. Kotaru intervenes and throws the ball back to the boys. However, Chihaya gets into an argument with her. Lucia snaps and pushes before storming off. Kotaru tries to talk to her, but she gets very emotional and runs off. Next up, we see a little girl trying to drop a ladybug on a flower, but the whole flower field dies, and the bug also turns to dust. Kotaru and his club members received mail to investigate a cursed girl named Asahi. The content of the letter said that Asahi arrived at an orphanage in the forest one day, and strange things started happening. First windows and mirrors started shattering, and pets suddenly died. Soon after, children and teachers started falling sick, so the orphanage was shut down. Kotaru finishes reading the letter, and tells them that a boy from the orphanage attended his former school seven years ago, and told them this same story. The boy was later cursed and died for disturbing Asahi's slumber. Kotaru informs Akani that Yoshino can corroborate his story so that he can finally carry out his perverted request of touching her. Meanwhile, Shizuru and Lucia didn't show up after the fight with Chihaya yesterday. Later on, he goes out to look for Shizuru because he wants to fix things between the girls before they can start their investigation. Kotaru asks Shizuru about Lucia's gloves, and Shizuru agrees to tell him on the condition that he stays friends with Lucia forever. After hearing the story, Kotaru comes up with a plan to help Lucia. He calls Yoshino to ask him about the dead boy from their former school, but Yoshino refuses to disrespect the dead and warns Kotaru to back off. Later that evening, Yoshino handed over his former school roaster with the names of his classmates from back then. Kotaru sees their teacher giving Lucia the key to the copier machine, so he runs to make a copy of the list. Lucia asks him what he wants to photocopy, but he tells her that she may be cursed for knowing. On his way out, she catches up with him and hands him a paper with a death warning about Asahi's curse, claiming that he left it in the machine, but Kotaru doesn't remember making a copy of the curse. Suddenly, the glass behind him shatters, and he remembers Yoshino's warning. He tells Lucia all about his investigation, and tells her that he doesn't believe in the curse, and will clear the girl's name. Lucia has no idea that Kotaru knows her secret yet, however, she is touched by his words, and agrees to help him clear Asahi's name. On her way home, Lucia sees the little girl, Asahi, who warns her to stop the investigation and reminds her of the dead flower field. Meanwhile, Kotaru calls everyone on the list. However, they are too scared of the curse and refuse to talk to him. Strangely, after the call, they all experienced mirrors and window breaking. He also gave Lucia a part of the list to call. Back home, Lucia is still being tormented by the shadow of the cursed girl. The following morning, she doesn't show up to school. Kotaru tries to call her, but she doesn't pick up. Inoue gives him a book about Asahi's curse and warns him that the last person who investigated the story got into a mysterious accident. Later that day, he goes to see the man who investigated the story. The man played a recording of glass shattering in the entire venue during the class reunion. He tells Kotaru that on his way back after the event, a huge billboard fell in front of him however, it didn't hurt him. But people exaggerated the incident and spread false rumors. While Kotaru was going back home, Lucia crept behind him and scared him badly. She was acting as if possessed by Asahi. She warns him to stop his investigations. The street lamp glass shatters, and Lucia passes out, so Kotaru takes her to his house. Meanwhile, a sleeping Lucia dreams about a woman. The woman touches her and immediately turns to dust. Once she wakes up, Kotaru apologizes for taking off her dress because it was wet. She picks up a leaf and it immediately turns to dust. She lies that it is the curse of Asahi 
and Kotaru humors her. However, he remembers his discussion with Shizuru, who had already told him Lucia's secret. The scene flashes back to when Lucia was young. Everything she touched died, so she convinced herself that it was a curse because her hands were filthy. She found solace in her gloves and vowed never to touch anything or anyone with her bare hands. Back in the present, Lucia tells Kotaru that she is filthy and starts insulting herself. Kotaru tries to touch her, but she quickly hits his hand and moves away from him, crying. However, the small exchange already affected Kotaru's hand. Later on, Kotaru goes to the abandoned orphanage. As he enters the compound, a camera monitors him. He sees a picture of the kids from the orphanage, but it shatters immediately when he looks at Asahi. Kotaru knows it is Lucia and calls her by name. She asks how he knew she was the one, and he tells her that a kid from the list already moved out of their old house. But the glass in the house was shattered, and the only people who knew about the list were Yoshino, her, and himself. He also adds that she saw the list from the copier, and that is how she knew he was investigating, and she quickly handed over the warning to him. While the duo were discussing, the rot on Kotaru's arm was already spreading gradually. She told him that she had done everything to make him stop, but he refused. She continues to tell him about her curse, takes off her gloves, and shatters a window to make her point. She tells him that it must remain a secret, and warns him to leave the orphanage, but it is too late. Kotaru collapses as the poison takes over his whole arm, and just then she remembers hitting his hand when he was trying to touch her in his house. Lucia weeps and apologizes for hurting him. He also apologizes for not being able to withstand her poison back then. He quickly rewrites his body to withstand the poison, and the rot on his arm disappears immediately. He explained his power to her and grabbed her hand, sternly warning her never to insult herself or make any extreme vows like she did before. Kotaru reassures her that she is never alone and that the members of the club will always be by her side. Lucia is still surprised that he can touch her without getting poisoned. She falls on his chest and starts crying profusely. Suddenly they're surrounded by armed men in hazmat suits, and Kotaru goes on the offensive, but she reassures him that they are on her side. One of the people in the suit walks up to them, and she is none other than their homeroom teacher, Nishikuju. She takes the duo back to the hospital. After tests in the hospital, she is amazed to find out that Kotaru's body is naturally resistant to the poison, but Lucia doesn't tell her the truth about his power. Kotaru asks again about their organization, and Nishikuju tells him that she belongs to an organization called Guardians. Lucia doesn't think they should tell him about it, but the teacher insists and says it is better than him snooping around. According to her, the organization gathers people with special powers to protect the Earth. Lucia informs him that one person is the key to the Earth's survival or destruction, and she is surprised when Kotaru believes their story. Nishikuju continues telling him about the key, and also about another organization called Gaia that wants to use the key to destroy humans, as they believe the key will regenerate the Earth. She tells him that he must keep everything he hears a secret. This crazy dude hears about the impending doom of the world, but somehow uses it to try and get his fantasy. He asks Lucia to prepare him lunch in an alluring maid uniform uniform in exchange for his silence. Nishikuju leaves them alone while Shizuru listens to them from the door. The next morning, Lucia pulls Kotaru ninja style from the hallway. She ties and blindfolds him. Shortly afterward, she opens the blindfolds to show him her alluring maid uniform. Kotaru is surprised and tells her that he was just joking about the uniform. Lucia is embarrassed and feels stupid that she took him seriously. To pacify her, he quickly tells her that the dress is very nice, and this calms her down. However, the stupid boy comments that she looks cute and earns himself a good beating. Once they both settled down, she served him a beautifully made lunch. Kotaru is very ecstatic because now he can die a happy fella. He praised her for her cooking skills, but Lucia told him that her taste buds are a little wonky, so Shizuru helped with the seasoning. Kotaru realized that was why she could eat the super spicy parfait the last time. She gives him a death stare when he tries to mention the Guardian organization, so he uses G for short. Lucia tells him that Shizuru has been her only friend because she can generate an anti-venom in her body, which makes her immune to the poison. Lucia apologizes to him for telling Shizuru about his power, and Kotaru tells her that it's fine. She has no idea that he already traded secrets with Shizuru first. She told him that they both decided not to tell anyone in the organization about him. Lucia also wondered if Chihaya would forgive her for how she acted the last time. Kotaru assures her and tells her that Chihaya has been looking for her, so she can also apologize. He held her hand and promised to be by her side. Lucia is so pleased that she addresses him casually. Kotaru is surprised and points it out, only to get himself kicked again. Soon afterward, Lucia goes to the club room and apologizes to Chihaya who feels embarrassed because she was planning to apologize first, but all she can think about in that instance is food. Laid back, Akane quickly brings her back to reality, and she also apologizes to Lucia for being a nosy b**k. Katori rewards her by feeding her bread. With her mouth stuffed, 
Chihaya points out that Lucia is being clingy with Kotaro. Lucia tells her that she is now besties with him, and Shizuru also fights for her place in his arms as a bestie. Kotaro quietly thanks her for not telling the G group about him. Kotaro gets all pumped up now that the gang is back together. They continue their wild goose chase for the supernatural. During their first quest for a legendary sword, they run into Yoshini, who has been sharpening his skills to pull out the legendary Excalibur. Chihaya pulls it out easily, and even breaks it with her strength. The second quest for a laugh that echoed in the darkness ended up being a laughing toy, and Kotaru got another beating from Lucia for looking at an X-rated magazine. Case number three was about an ogre who screams in the school every night, and that ended up being Yoshino practicing karate. The fourth case was even more absurd. They heard rumors that a T-Rex was still alive, but that was also a sham. That weekend, the group received a request to investigate a Rainbow River. This new quest sounded like a picnic for the glutton Chihaya, so she told Sakuya to fill up her lunchbox. Kotaro wanted a word in, but Sakuya ignored him and started talking about food to prepare for the picnic. Akane was not buying this new case. She was already fed up with all the fake news. Kotaro assured her that it was real, so he decided they should vote to decide if they should follow the lead, but surprisingly, the girls voted against it. He was counting on Shizuru to say yes, but she also turned him down. He ignores their vote and announces that they will be going to the forest the next day. The next day, Kotaro joins the group, but he is a little late, so Lucia scolds him but he is just glad that she has dropped the lovey-dovey clingy attitude. For protection, Katori brought a cute-looking squishy dog, Chibimoth, the same one Kotaru saw in the forest when he was looking for her. She informs him that the dog is three times stronger than Yoshino, but he doesn't believe her, so to prove her point, the dog attacks Kotaru. He tried to convince the others that it was a mammoth parading as a dog, but no one else could see it. They thought he was lying because a cute little dog defeated him. They continue their quest while Lucia, Shizuru, Kotori, and Chihaya show each other the snacks they packed for the journey. Akane and Kotaro do not participate in the food show and tell. The dog barks to bring their attention to a shiny river. Kotaru checks his map for coordinates and boasts that he is very reliable, but Akane doesn't believe him. She brings emergency flares in case they get lost. Kotori almost drinks the water from the river, but Lucia and Akane quickly stop her since the water could contain wastewater. Shizuru also gulped down a handful. Kotaru and Lucia gave each other a look, knowing that the water could not harm her because of her powers. The group continues their journey, and they stop for a moment to talk about the environment. Lucia and Akane clash with their views about the environment and humans. Lucia believes that humans making adjustments in order to survive is natural, but Akane believes that humans are a problem to the environment and their improvement is fatal to Earth. Shizuru calms them down before the discussion gets out of hand. A little into the journey, they notice that the air is getting suffocating and that there are no insects or birds in that part of the forest. Shizuru runs into the forest after a demon, and Lucia follows her while the rest of the team follows the dog, who leads them to a smelly part of the forest where they find the rainbow-colored river. Lucia stops Kotaru from stepping too close to the river and shows him the dead animals that died from entering it. The animal Shizuru was chasing also died when it touched the river. He notices that the animal is two-headed, and Akane tells him that the toxins in the forest cause birth defects in the animals. She asks him how he plans to resolve the problem, but Kotaru doesn't have an answer. They bury Shizuru's dead friend and decide to go back home. On their way home, Kotaru informs them that he will not be posting about the Rainbow River. It could have been a huge scoop for their club, but it wasn't safe to tell people about it. Suddenly, Kotaru stops because that part of the forest seems familiar to him, but he cannot remember why. He turns around to see the Red Ribbon Ghost Girl and chases her. He catches up and tries to confront her, but suddenly gets some brain-shattering visions of his death as soon as he sees the tree behind her and almost passes out. The girls rally around him and help him get back up. Later that night, he goes back to the club room to find the ever-classy Akane in a not-so-classy situation situation. Kotaru came back to record their findings since he couldn't sleep. Akane gives him a low score for his entry, and tells him that it looks like a child wrote the report. She teaches him about global warming and how humans are destroying the earth without care. She gets all dark and starts talking about human extinction. But Kotaru laughs it off but starts sweating when she gets too serious. Say ah! Kotaru thinks about his friends and tells her that he knows a few people who want to change the world for the better. Akane tells him that the only way to do that is to get rid of humans. She chuckles like a maniac, scaring Kotaru. The next morning, Inoue calls Kotaru and tells him that she has juicy intel on the cause of the Rainbow Swamp. She tells him that she is going to check out the forest later before printing her scoop. After dropping the call, he jumps up to check if she has a spy in the room watching him. Three days later, a girl from the news club informs him that Inoue never returned home after going to the forest.
A search party is deployed to look for Inoue, and her bag is found in the forest where she went missing. Five days after Inoue goes missing, Akane informs the members that the club activities will be suspended. Shizuru says that Inoue was always asking her about Kotaru. They thought she meant the whole school, but it was only the occult club activities since Kotaru may be a person of interest in the girl's disappearance. <laughs> she informs them that the school may use their club as a scapegoat, so disbanding is the best solution. Kotaru doesn't agree, but the rest of the team thinks it is for the best. Kotaru reminds them of all the good times they had in the past. The girls are touched but still think it is best they lay low. Akane informs them that the search for Inoue has been called off since the authorities believe that she may already be dead. Kotaru tells them that they need to find her. He says she may be alive since they couldn't find a body. They all agree to help him find her, although Akane regrets allowing crazy people into the club. The following day, they meet in the forest to begin their quest. He tells them that they need to finish by 3 p.m. to make sure they return home before dark. The previous night, Kotaru had already mapped out their trip, and he also ran into butler Sakuya doing snack errands for Chihaya. That is how Kotaru knew she brought snacks for their trip. The two dismiss each other as usual. Sakuya warns him to stop being nosy if he treasures his current ordinary life and leaves him with a cliffhanger but Kotaru doesn't understand what he means. Back in the present, Shizuru finds shoe tracks that may belong to Inoue. Lucia also confirms her suspicion, and Kotaru asks Shizuru to follow the tracks. After a while, the tracks disappear, so the girls decide to take bathroom breaks. Kotaru cannot understand why girls need to go to the bathroom in groups. He sits down to wait for them and zones out, thinking about Inoue, but after 30 minutes, the girls have still not returned. Kotaru gets worried and goes out to look for them. On his way, he sees a hooded man and quietly follows him, thinking that the girls must be in danger. He suddenly runs into a couple of similar demon dogs that almost killed him before. They attack him, but Kotaru swiftly gets away. However, his speed enhancement from the last time is not enough, so he kicks it up a notch with his magic. Even with this, his body doesn't adapt quickly to the enhancement, so he gets pinned down by the demons. He screams desperately, and sharp wolverine-like blades burst from his hand, killing one of the demons. The rest quickly retreat into the forest. Kotaru is surprised because he doesn't remember having wolverine powers and the blades disappear, but he is still relieved that he didn't become dog food. He hears Lucia's voice and goes to check on the girls. He finds some T-Rex-looking demons trying to attack Lucia and Shizuru, but the girls handle the situation like pros, slicing through the horde like a piñata. Shizuru quickly heals a wounded Kotaru and tells him that they are in Gaian territory. He also remembers hearing a similar story from Lucia. After healing him, the girls tell him to go look for Katori and the others, and assure him they can handle the T-Rex situation thanks to their training from Guardian. While Kotaru tries to leave, one of the demons chases after him, but Lucia quickly cuts it down. Soon Kotaru reaches a clearing, and she hides almost mauls him with a huge tree, but he dodges it. He finds the rest of the gang and tells them that they need to leave the forest fast, but the girls are not in a hurry. He tries to rush them, but too, because the demon boss, a very large dragon-looking Venus flytrapper, shows up from above. It almost hits Katori, but Kotaru pushes her away and gets his hand stuck in the trap. He tells them to run away and meet up with the other two girls. Chihaya and Akane leave together while Katori goes in another direction to get help. The creature starts sucking blood from Kotaru's punctured arm and drags him around. He screams, and his wolverine blade appears again and cuts away the monster's sucker from his arm. The demon attacks him again but Kotaru can't land a blow even with his new blades. It is safe to say that the idiot only knows how to run. The monster almost kills him, but the red ribbon ghost girl, Kagari, saves his life. She proceeds to turn the monster boss into sushi with her ribbon. After defeating the monster, she walks up to Kotaru, but he is too scared of her because of his visions and almost tries to kill her. What an ungrateful fellow. Luckily, Kotori intervenes before it gets messy and tells the red ribbon girl to go away. Wow, shocker. Kotori has been playing pretend all along. Kotaru calms down and asks how she can see the ghost, but she avoids the question. Kotori helps him up, and on the way she babbles about club activities. They find that Shizuru and Lucia have already killed all the T-Rex demons, but they see that the duo is having a face-off with Chihaya and Akane. Lucia pointed out that the demons refused to attack Akane and Chihaya, even though they were defenseless. Shizuru also tells them that they didn't look surprised when the demons attacked. Akane tries to give some flimsy excuse, but the girls are not buying it. Finally, Akane drops her good girl act and tells them she was surprised that the duo are guardian superhumans. Kotaru realizes that Akane and Chihaya are part of Gaia, and the girls also think that he is also part of the guardian. <laughs> Shizuru wants to believe that the girls didn't plan the attack, but Akane insinuates that she knew about the attack. Lucia tries to attack her, but Sakuya suddenly appears and stops her. Her blade doesn't even cut him because he is also a demon who works for Gaia. Sakuya assures them that although Gaia is responsible for the attack, Chihaya and Akane have nothing to do with it. Lucia doesn't believe him, but Shizuru does. Chihaya feels bad, 
but Akane is unapologetic about it. Sakuya picks up the two girls and flies off. Chihaya feels really sad that she lost her friends. Kotaru passes out from exhaustion and his wounds. The following day, none of the girls came to school, including Kotori. Kotaru tried to reach them. However, no one was responding to his calls or messages, even their class teacher, Nishikuju, who is also a member of Guardian, was also absent. Yoshino also gets worried and asks Kotaru if he is okay, but Kotaru tells him that everything is fine, but that is not true, because he is worried about the girls. He remembers Sakuya's words and realizes that his ordinary life truly just got shattered. Next up, we see an asteroid making its way to Earth. Meanwhile, the Red Ribbon Ghost Girl is seen on top of Kotaru's roof still thinking about how he placed his hands on her chest. The asteroid somehow lands directly on her head, and she passes out, but thankfully, it is just a tiny pebble. Three days later, Kotaru stops at Katori's house to check on her, but no one answers the door. He can't stop thinking about everything that went down during their trip. Everything at school reminded him of his friends. He hasn't heard from them since then, and there is no news about Inoue either. The new teacher informs the class that the girls have come down with a cold, which is why they are absent. Kotaru understands why the four girls disappeared, but he couldn't understand why Katori was absent absent, and even ignored him. After class, Yoshino asks him why all his friends were absent, but Kotaru lies that they were out sick. Yoshino is sure that something is going on, but he cannot bring himself to show Kotaru that he cares. We can see the bromance brewing. Later that night, Kotaru decides to investigate his new Wolverine powers. Once the blade comes out, our pervy ghost girl wakes up from her asteroid-induced slumber party. Kotaru tries the blades on his shoes and slices them like sushi, so he goes to get more items for further testing. When he returns, the red ribbon ghost girl has already sneaked into his room. He tries to attack her, but she calls his name and then faints in his arms. Kotaru is shocked because all this time he believed she was a ghost. Damn, so ghosts don't faint. The next morning, the teacher announces that Inoue has been found. She was found in a hospital in the next town, with a wonky memory. The ordeal was too traumatic for the family, so they moved away from Kazumatsuri. Kotaru got his dose of wastewater coffee while thinking about the news. He threw the paper cup on the floor, and it reminded him of Lucia. Suddenly Shizuru showed up and picked it up. She only came to tell him goodbye, and before he could talk to her, she disappeared immediately. Later that night, Kotaru came home to see his house trashed by the Red Ribbon Ghost Girl. He searched for her, but she was hanging on the ceiling. She played with him for a bit before scaring the hell out of him. She finally introduces herself to him as Kagari, and tells him that she doesn't remember anything else. Wow, an amnesiac ghost who is no longer a ghost. At this point, we'll just keep calling her the Red Ribbon Ghost Girl. It turns out the meteor did a whole lot more than just a slumber party. She informs Kotaru that she is on an important mission but can't remember the details. She asks for his help, but Kotaru is not exactly thrilled about helping his ex-tormentor, but he has no choice but to help. The following morning, he wakes up to a red ribbon girl sucking on his arm. At least we know that she is a selective amnesiac. Kotaru prepares for school, and tells her that she needs to find her memories by herself. He decides to show her how to use the internet, but first removes her from the room to clear his adult video collection. Afterward, he leaves her with a laptop and leaves for school. After class, on his way to the cafeteria, Kotaru is surprised to find Kagari in his school, and with their uniform, they are having a face-off with Yoshino, who has refused to let her into the classroom. She informs him that she is a friend of Kotaru, but Yoshino still tries to send her to the staff room. He gets destroyed by her red ribbon as soon as he lays a hand on her shoulder. The students are bewildered that the strongest guy was floored by a tiny girl. They start applauding, so Kotaru quickly grabs her like a handbag and runs outside. He reprimands her, but she blames him for leaving her alone. She pours out her internet education to Kotaru and tells him that, from her research, he is in love with her. She also tells him that she will be enrolling in the school so she can learn about herself, but Kotaru informs her that the school only teaches academics. He asks how she got the uniform, she immediately changes it back to her goth black gown, and boasts that she can transform it into whatever she wants, but Kotaru is not impressed. Next up, Kotaru takes her on a tour of the school. They stop by the cafeteria first, and she tries the horrible tasting wastewater coffee, and is impressed by the taste. She starts shouting like a madwoman in the cafeteria, asking for the amazing person who created the coffee. Kotaru quickly picks her up and runs out. Once they're outside, she tells Kotaru to give her three months' worth of coffee as a sign of his undying love for her. He wants to scream at her, but it reminds him of his time with the girls. Kotaru turns around to Inoue, and he floods her with questions, but she doesn't even remember who he is. Meanwhile, Kagari plays with her ribbon on the bridge while the duo sits down in the park to talk. Kotaru reminds Inoue all about their encounter with each other. Inoue hands him a memory card that she was clinging to when she was found. Inoue says that something brought her out here, and it must be because her subconscious wants him to have the card. Finally, the duo bid each other goodbye. 
Kagari tells Kotaru that Inoue must have trusted him enough to hand over the card, even though she doesn't remember him. Later on, Kotaru goes back to check the memory card, and the Red Ribbon Ghost Girl refuses to leave his house, and suggests that he may have done something shady to be able to leave a huge house like this alone. Kotaru explains that his parents own the house, but they're busy researchers who work for Martel Group, an environmental protection agency, and never come home. At the Gaia headquarters, Akani is seen with her grandmother, Sakura, the head of the group, and the board members welcome Akani back. She is the next in line to lead the group, but the members don't seem to like her. After the meeting, she is greeted by a little goth-looking girl, Shimako, who is also next in line for the Gaia throne after Akane. Sakuya and Chihaya join her from a secret passageway. She tells them that she is on wheelchair duty, and that her grandmother is almost at death's door. She jumps happily when Sakuya hands her the gaming PC they went to collect from the school via the secret tunnels. Through their conversation, we learn that the Martel group is just another name for Gaia, and the club room is connected to the headquarters via a hidden passage. Chihaya missed the group, and Sakuya informed her that Akani was the one who made sure that Inoue was protected. Akani worries that both organizations may be targeting Kotaru, so they may need to look out for him. Somewhere else, Lucia and Shizuru work together to battle a large demon. Shizuru wounds it, while Lucia pins it to the ground by collapsing the roof on it. Shizuru finishes it with her gun, after remembering what demons did to her parents. After the fight, Asaka, who is also a guardian, joins them after chasing a Gaia summoner, and he commends them for a job well done. The class teacher, Nishikuju, joins the trio and hugs Shizuru fondly as usual before saluting Asaka. They talk about Gaia and the key, and he informs them that a war is coming as a lot of demons have been deployed by Gaia. Next up, we see Sakuya with our favorite blood-sucking tiny demon Gil and his companion Pani. He locked them up for making a bird poop on Chihaya, and Sakuya sends them on a mission to spy on Kotaru. Kotaru finally checks Inoue's memory card. On it, she documents several demons and masked summoners deployed into the forest by Gaia. When Kagari interrupts him to read her favorite web comic from his laptop. She sees a photo of a place that looks familiar to her. Kotaru is relieved when Katori finally messages him, explaining that she is fine and down with a cold. He messages her back, and we see Katori in a forest surrounded by different demons and acting suspiciously. Next up, Lucia and Shizuru are seen with the red-headed guy, Imamiya, who warned Kotaru about thugs when he was looking for the antique store. The duo tells him that they need to keep an eye on Kotaru. He tells them that Kotori is missing, but since their cover has been blown, he will be watching Kotaru on their behalf. For the first time in a few days, Kotaru decides to relax and have a hot bath, but the pervy red ribbon ghost girl barges into the bathroom to talk. The following day, Pani and Bloodsucker Gil fly around looking for Kotaru. Meanwhile, Kotaru takes Kagari out to see the city as per her request in the bathroom, and he buys her a cup of coffee, which tastes even better than cafeteria coffee. Soon afterward, Gil and Pani find Kotaru. Imamiya from Gaia is also close by watching him. Katori also sends her mammoth dog to watch Kotaru. Later on, he takes her to see Asaka, since he is more versed in supernatural creatures, but the store is closed. Kagari suggests that they ask her fans, who have been following her all day, about her life. That is when Kotaru notices that they are being followed, so he grabs her and runs off. Although Kagari doesn't understand why they have to run, since the internet says that fan service is important to idols. The surveillance team notices that they've been made and chases after the duo. Kotaru enters Yoshino's territory, and the eggplant-looking guy tries to stop him but gets a kick in the face. Yoshino the king interrupts them and walks in like it is his runway. He is shocked to see Kotaru, the duo bickering a bit before Kotaru tells him that they've been chased. Yoshino shows him an alley and tells him to use it. On his way out, Kotaro tells him that Kotori reached out to him. Shortly after the amateur surveillance team crashes into each and engages in a brawl, Yoshino and his crew interrupt them and beat up the red-headed Imamiya. After a while, Kotaru stops to rest but the Red Ribbon Girl almost passes out and asks him to get her more coffee. She starts screaming, drawing people's attention and putting him in a questionable position. Kotaru goes to a vending machine to get coffee but runs into Lucia. Kagari joins them and holds Kotaru at the back of his waist, causing another misunderstanding. Lucia informs him that the two organizations are keeping an eye on him and will stop once they are convinced that he is not a threat. She bids him farewell and leaves abruptly. Lucia reports back to the teacher but doesn't mention running into Kotaru. The teacher informs her that Asaka and all the former guardians have returned because Gaia's activities have recently become too active. Later on, Kotaru and Kagari sit down to rest while she declares that canned coffee reigns supreme above others. The duo is about to leave when they run into a Gaia summoner, Midu, the same lizard-looking guy that almost killed Kotaru and his dog demons. Kagari steps in to threaten Midu the summoner. He tries to attack her but gets punched by Kotaro. This dude knows how to save his women, but never himself. The dogs try to play fetch with Kotaru's head, however, Kagari's ribbon butchers them instantly. The lizard-looking summoner tries to summon fire, but Kotori's Pikachu-looking dog kicks him off and signals them to run away. 
Kotaru grabs Kagari and runs as fast as Flash. Back home, Kotaru worries that someone may have seen him use his powers, and the Red Ribbon Girl is also surprised that she can turn things into sushi with her powers. Inside the house, Kotaru finds his house thrashed. He checks the fridge and finds Pani inside freezing. Kagari mourns her lost coffee beans that she secretly ordered online. He informs her that her internet privileges are revoked. He finds the annoying bloodsucker Gil and shuts both of them inside a container. He goes on to interrogate them about Gaia, but the duo refuses to talk. While boasting about being useful, Loudmouth Gil mistakenly mentions that they followed him all day. Kotaru shakes them around inside the container, and before they can confess, Chbimoth interrupts them. Katori immediately calls Kotaru on the phone and tells him to come to the forest with the Red Ribbon Girl Kagari. But Kotaru can't believe she knew everything all this while. All along she had been watching him through Chibimoth's eye. She promises to tell him everything once they meet up. Chibimoth takes them to the entrance of the secret forest, and suddenly Katori pulls them into another dimension. Kotaru finds himself inside a whimsical forest with demons moving around peacefully. Kagari tells them that this forest looks familiar to her, and Katori says she was born in this place. She is however surprised that Kagari now has a physical body, because she was born a ghost. Kotaru is angry with Katori for telling him that he was insane before. She apologizes to him for pretending. Kagari is happy that she finally meets someone who can tell her about herself, so she abandons Kotaru and asks him to leave. As they settle inside the forest, Kotori tells him that the demons inside the secret forest are peaceful because she made them. She also made the cute mammoth, but made him appear as a dog. She tells him that she is a druid and she has to protect the key, but she is not affiliated with Gaia or Guardian. A long time ago, a summoner sealed all his knowledge into a mistletoe. It stayed hidden waiting to be passed on to someone worthy. Ten years ago, Katori and her parents were in a car accident. She wandered into the forest when she came to and found the mistletoe, which gave her all the knowledge and power. Kotaro doesn't remember hearing about any accidents from ten years ago. She tells him that Kagari is the key, and she has been tasked with protecting her. However, the two organizations have been fighting over the key, both claiming that they want to save the world. Kotaru is confused because Lucia told him that Gaia wanted to destroy the world with the key. Katori shows them the heart of the forest, where she saw the mistletoe, and also where Kagari was born. She reminds him of how he stumbled upon the tree during the trip. Kagari carelessly lifted the barrier that day, exposing the tree. Kotaru notices that the glowing pond at the root of the giant tree looks like his wolverine blades. He tries to touch it, but Kotori warns him that he might melt if he touches it. The pond is the energy spot of the earth, and Kagari was born as an avatar of the earth. The rainbow swamp they investigated was caused by this glowy pond, and Kotori uses it to make demons without chipping away at her lifespan. She says that demon summoners use their lifespans to create and control demons. Kotaru asks about Kagari's role in all this, but Katori doesn't know how Kagari is supposed to make or break the world, since nobody has experienced it yet. She apologizes for dragging him into all the drama, and he playfully tells her that they are best friends, so he doesn't mind. Kotaru remembers confessing his love to her when they were younger, however she turned him down. He is happy he can finally prove to Akani that the supernatural exists, which means he can get his twisted fantasy over with. Kagari suddenly starts hearing a song that they both can't hear. The song was coming from the Martel headquarters. Akane is exhausted from listening to the awful choir of doom with her grandmother, Chihaya also finds the song disturbing, and Akane says that a war between Gaia and Guardian is about to start. At Guardian HQ, Nishikuju reprimands Imamiya for losing his target, and all the warriors of Guardian also gather to discuss the key and Gaia. Inside the whimsical forest, the tiny demons escape and inform Sakuya via Skype about Kotaru's location. Sakuya decides to go there without informing Chihaya. Sakuya easily destroys Katori's barrier with force and enters the forest. He is surprised to see that the key, Kagari, is with them. When he threatens to take Katori and Kagari with him to Gaia, Kotaru tries to stop him, but one slap from Sakuya sends him to the ground. Kotaru summons his Wolverine Blade, however Sakuya is not phased. The stupid tiny demon spies Gil and Pani interrupts the fight, and Gil proudly blows his cover as a spy. Sakuya, on the other hand, was just joking around and didn't come to do anything bad. They were all surprised when he asked if they needed a butler. Kotaru hangs Gil and Pani on a tree with traitor tags on their necks. Sakuya tells Katori that her barrier is clever, but doesn't stand a chance when it comes in contact with a strong superhuman. Kotaru is still angry that he sent the demons to deceive him. Sakuya says Akane sent him to protect them. He didn't want to leave, but Chihaya was convinced. Sakuya is actually contracted to Chihaya as her demon, so she also shares his superhuman strength. Katori thanks him for coming to help them, and Kotaro asks him to train him. 
Soon afterward, Sakuya takes on his housekeeping duties and serves the girls diligently. After a few days, Kotaru gets fed up and begs him to teach him how to fight. In his first lesson, Sakuya picks him up and flings him away like paper. Kotaro gets angry and Wolverine's out. Kagari is bored, however everyone is too busy to hang out, so she decides to explore the forest, including Katori's room of secrets. Later, she goes with the puny demons to watch Kotaru's training, where Sakuya is kicking his ass mercilessly. Pani tells her that Kotaru must love her a lot, which is why he is pushing himself this far. Kagari also flashes back to when Katori was telling her that he's training hard for her sake, so she believes Pani's Delulu. Kotaru is tired after his training, and Kagari offers him the coffee that Katori taught her to brew. It tasted terrible, but he gave her an A for effort. Sakuya joins them, and Katori offers him coffee. However, he almost dies from the taste and decides to brew real coffee for them. After tasting his coffee, Kagari is not impressed. Kotaru tells them that her favorite is cheap coffee. Sakuya accepts the challenge and vows to impress her with his coffee. Later on, they continue with Kotaru's training, although it looks like Kotaru may be too useless to be redeemed. At night, while everyone is resting, Kotaru goes out to continue practicing, while Kagari watches him from a distance. The following day, Sakuya tries to impress Kagari with a new coffee brew, but it doesn't work. Katori informs him that they need to make a supply run. Kagari offers to go since she is bored, and Sakuya's coffee is too gross. Katori worries about her safety outside the forest, so Sakuya offers to go with her. He tells them that due to the Harvest Fiesta in town, the two organizations' surveillance will be a bit wonky because of the crowds in town out for the celebrations. After shopping, Kotaru mounts the supplies on the mammoth dog and sends it back to the forest. He sees some of his classmates and quickly dodges them since he has been absent from school for a while. Sakuya takes them on a surprise visit to see Akane. She tells Kotaru that she is the next heir to the Martel group, and Kotaru is shocked to find out that Martel is just Gaia in disguise. She asks Kagari how she intends to judge humans. Kagari says that she is currently searching for herself and doesn't understand what she is supposed to do yet. Suddenly, Akane starts crying. Kagari gives her a canned coffee and tells her that humans seem amazing for creating wonderful things like coffee and the internet. She cheers Akane up and says that the best thing Kotaru ever gave her was canned coffee. Akane is shocked that canned coffee was used to win the key over and chuckles cheerfully. She reminisced a bit about the past with Kotaru and tore his questionnaire from his first day at the club. She says that her time with the men members will always be her happy place. She bid him farewell and told him that it would be the last time they saw each other. Stupid Kotaru ruins the melancholic goodbye by reminding her that she promised to let him place his hand on her chest if he wins. Akane is shocked, but he tells her that his pervy fantasy transcends reason, and even the Earth's impending doom. Kotaru throws the canned coffee out and sends Kagari to play fetch while he locks the door. After a little resistance, Akane agrees and asks him to do it, but he stops and Cooley tells her that he will do it next time when they meet in the club room. Somewhere in Guardian HQ, Asaka informs his comrades that the key has appeared and shows them some points on a map where it is likely located. The red-headed Imamiya tells them that the blue patch is even more suspicious since Katori has been seen in the area a couple of times. Shizuru asks them to put her in charge of the area, but the group no longer trusts her and Lucia, so they are thrown out of the meeting and moved to another team. Shizuru wonders if Katori is also a part of Gaia. She is also worried about Kotaru's disappearance. Lucia tells her to forget everything and focus on finding the key. On their way back from slacking off the stupid tiny daemons, Gil and Panny lead the lizard face summoner directly to the entrance of the barrier. Next up, at the top of the Martell building, Akani listens to her grandmother voice her hatred for humans. She agrees with the old woman, but her grandmother doesn't believe her. She promises Akani that she will definitely yearn for the destruction of the Earth one day. At Guardian HQ, Shizuru prepares to go find her friends, but Lucia stops her. She tries to convince her to forget about that life, but Shizuru refuses and tries to drive off, so Lucia stops her with her sword. She sheaths the sword and tells Shizuru that she will go to the forest instead, promising not to do anything bad. That night in the whimsical forest, Kagari watches Kotaru's training, he is starting to make headway, and Sakuya commends him, but he is not content with it and tries to rewrite his ability, but Sakuya lands face flat on the ground before he can make headway. Sakuya warns him not to rely solely on his powers, because once he overuses the rewrite, he will cease to be human. Long after practice ends, Kotaru continues to train. Kagari asks why he is pushing himself so hard. Kotaru says that he needs to, so that he can protect her. She tells him that it must mean that he loves her. Kotaru tells her that it is not love. He gets a flashback of his days with the club members, and tells her that he just wants to fight for the friendships he used to have, because those were the people he fit in with. Kotaru vows to fight and get back his friends. Kagari grabs his arm and bites it. While he screams in pain, she says that he is curious about his arm. She zones out and starts thinking. Sakuya watches the duo's exchange from afar. Lucia is seen running through the forest 
looking for Katori. She runs into a group of Gaian summoners talking about the entrance to the barrier, so she hides. The lizard-looking summoner tells his team that the key is inside the barrier, and tells them everything he heard from the two tiny stupid demons. Kotaru decides to follow them so that she can get to the key first. She worries that the summoners may hurt Kotaru and Katori, but assures herself that the key is her top priority. But her resolve breaks as soon as she remembers Kotaru, and she vows to protect her friends first. Meanwhile, Akani tells Chihaya to join Sakuya and never come back to Gaia HQ again. Chihaya doesn't want to go, but Akani teases her, saying the only job she is good at is being Shimako's nanny. Chihaya calls her a meanie and agrees to leave. Akani feels that Chihaya will not be able to endure the coming war since she is too kind. She gives her a letter for Kotaru and tells her that they can all get together again once the war is over. Chihaya excitedly agrees. Back in the forest, Lucia chases after the summoners and takes down the other two. She tries to take down the lizard-faced summoner before he summons a demon, but he blocks her with fire and quickly summons a lava demon and attacks her. However, Lucia dodges it and it sets the forest on fire. He increases the frequency of the attack, however. She dodges them so well and finally gets close to him. He quickly turns the lava into a strong silicon shield and hits her with it. Since her blades are useless against his lava, Lucia takes off her gloves, places her hand on the ground and apologizes to the forest before using poison to kill off the trees and put off the fire. Midu summons the lava demon as stones, and Lucia cuts right through it with her sword. He tries to attack again, however, it is too late. The lava demon has already been poisoned by her touch, and since he is linked to it, the poison also affects him. Lucia tries to finish him off, but the maniac unleashes lava into the whole forest. The explosion makes her lose her balance, and he throws a spear from his little bubble that fatally wounds her. The evil lizard guy laughs maniacally like the Joker. Meanwhile, as she falls off the cliff, Lucia remembers the good time she spent with Kotaru and her friends. In this scene, a voice tells how she and her people were once happy, but one day their small happy village is brutally attacked, and everyone dies except her. The girl says that after the war, they were once again reborn, and fated to pass down their memories and emotions after death to the next generation of women who take over. She says that beauty exists in this world, but ugliness and hatred take up more than beauty, and each time they were reborn, there was even more evil than the last time, which tainted their hearts. So many years later, their hearts have now twisted into disgust for mankind. The narrator is seen on top of the Martel building in the same wheelchair as the current leader of Gaia, Sakura, but when she turns, Akani is the one in the chair. She then asks if humanity truly deserves to be a part of the world and lets out an evil smile. Now, back in reality, it is revealed that Akani was just dreaming, but the dream creeps her out, and she quickly hugs and thanks Shimako, who was watching her while she slept. Meanwhile, Chihaya has already left Gaia HQ, trying to locate Katori's secret forest, but she gets lost. She looks around and finds a bleeding Lucia on the ground. She rushes to her and picks her up. Fortunately, she sees Kotaru and Katori approaching and happily calls out to them. Kotaru carries Lucia, and as the group returns to the hideout, Katori starts revitalizing Lucia's life force, which is similar to giving life to demons. Meanwhile, Sakuya and the puny demons stumble on the patch in the forest where Lucia fought the summoner. He notes that a fierce battle was fought there, and one person used fire. He tells Gil to take a deep breath, and immediately Gil almost chokes and drops to the ground. Sakuya tells him the whole area is covered with poison. Inside the forest, Katori can't seem to get Lucia's bleeding to stop. Kagari suggests that they use her red ribbon. Katori wraps the ribbon around her injured abdomen, and instantly, Lucia feels better. Everyone is relieved when Katori announces that Lucia is getting better and just needs rest. Kagari praises herself for being the key and proving to be powerful. Kotaru suddenly hugs her, grateful for her help, but she uses her ribbon to slap him silly. Lucia hears the commotion and wakes up. She looks at Kagri and says that she never thought she would see the key, and she thanks her for helping with her powered ribbon. She also thanks her friends for saving her. Kagari asks them who Lucia is. Kotaru thinks for a moment, but she cannot find the best word to describe her. Lucia tries to explain that she belongs to an organization that is out to kill the key, but Kotaru quickly interrupts her and says they are all friends from the same club at school. Katori and Chihaya also concur. Lucia is touched and starts crying. Sakuya returns and interrupts their little moment. He informs them that he will be reinforcing the barrier and stepping up Kotaru's training as a form of stress relief, and everyone laughs happily. Meanwhile, at Gaia HQ, Akani hopes that Chihaya has met up with the group, and suddenly she gets visions of her grandmother when she is still young. Akani realizes that this may be part of the successor's burden that her grandmother told her about. She receives a call and is informed that her grandmother has collapsed. Just then, it looks like something changes inside her as the light disappears from her eyes. At Guardian HQ, Nishikuju asks Shizuru if she has seen Luchia, but Shizuru says no. Meanwhile, Kotaru follows Katori to the power spot to fetch some earth juice for making her demons. She sees something swirling in the pool but dismisses it. Katori wants to make more demons in case they are attacked, 
So she explains to Kotaru how she makes her demons. She brings them to life by giving them a body and forming a contract with them. She tells him that using animal corpses is more effective, but she uses whatever she can find. Katori finishes her newest design, a bird demon, and then drops a bit of earth juice on it, forcing it to come to life, but immediately dies. She checks it out, wondering if she messed up the process. Akane watches her sick grandmother for a while before leaving. On her way out, she runs into the lizard-faced summoner who almost killed Lucia. He tells her that he found her friends in the forest, and asks what she plans on doing with the key by sending the apex to the forest. At this point, we are not sure who this apex is, and it looks like Akane has a sinister plot in place. The lizard-faced guy tells her that he will hunt everyone in the forest regardless of her plans. He tries to leave, but the poison is already killing him. Akane decides to make a deal with him. She takes him to Gaia's second ultimate weapon, a giant dinosaur-looking demon. She tells him that the apex is the first. She promises him the dinosaur demon, but warns him that it will consume his life force faster. Akane tells him that he must protect the key at any cost. He doesn't like the idea, but she tells him that they need the key alive to destroy the world and he agrees to her deal. He asks her if he can kill the rest of her friends, and she tells him yes. She also answers the question the voice from her dream asked, and says that humanity is not deserving of a place in the future. The lizard-faced guy likes this new and improved Akani, and promises her that he will crush everything in his path that is not the key. During an intense round of training, Kotaru almost crushes the puny demon Gil. Meanwhile, Katori is still trying to solve her dead demon problem. She tells Chihaya that it may be due to the contaminated area he saw outside the barrier. Lucia hears them and says that it is her fault. Kagari interrupts them and forces her coffee on Lucia, who turns her down. It pours on Lucia's face, so Kagari starts licking it up. The girls decide to go relax in a pond. Chihaya carries Lucia up the stairs, even when she refuses. While they are relaxing, Chihaya asks Lucia why she is still wearing gloves, and Lucia tells them the story about her poisoned hand problem. Chihaya is deeply sorry, as she remembers how insensitive she was during their fight in school. Lucia tells her not to fret. She says that it is strange that a member of Gaia who wants to destroy humanity is worried about her. Kagari interrupts them and says that both Gaia and Guardian claim that they are trying to save the world but that is all lies. After their bath, everyone gathers together while Sakuya serves the coffee, but Kagari drinks her favorite canned coffee instead. Kotaru asks why Gaia and Guardian are fighting when they share the same goal, and Sakuya tells him that it is similar, but not the same. Chihaya says that Gaia's goal is to eradicate humanity and save an empty world. Lucia says that the Guardian wants to preserve the world along with the humans in it. Katori tells them that druids want to protect the key until it makes its own judgment, and her job description does not include influencing said judgment. While they are having this serious serious discussion, Kagari, who holds Earth's survival in her hands, only cares about coffee. Well, they are definitely doomed. Meanwhile, Katori's demon seems to have been revived. Kotaru asks them how the organizations intend to use the key, and Sakuya says that Gaia plans to keep her safe until they understand how she is supposed to save the world. Lucia says the Guardian plans to erase the key. Kagari finally speaks up and proudly calls herself a temptress since so many people are fighting over her. Lucia laughs and says she has no intention of hurting the key anymore. The girls laugh happily since they don't have to fight each other again. Kagari doesn't get why the remaining humans can't have a mature conversation like this group to resolve their issues. She tells them that, from her research, humans have been chipping away at the lifespan of the Earth with their wars. Later that night, while everyone was sleeping, Kotaru remembered what Akani said about getting rid of humans to save the Earth. He took a walk and found Kagari also awake. He asks her if humans are really useful and should be rid of the Earth. She says that after watching Kotaru, humans may have some hope. She looks up and suddenly zones out. She starts babbling, and Kotaru tries to touch her, but she hits him with her ribbon and then passes out. On the last day of the Harvest Fiesta, the lizard-faced summoner is now in good shape. He takes his two minions and leaves the Gaia HQ to wreak havoc. Meanwhile, at the top of the building, Mina Kani says to herself that playtime is over for humans. Suddenly she gets wobbly, and the nice Akani comes back and whispers that it can't end yet. It looks like Akani now has a split personality. Inside the Guardian's surveillance van, Imamiya is informed that they've lost all their team that was sent to scout the forest. Meanwhile, in the Guardian HQ command room, Asaka gives them the update he received from the van, and informs them that a powerful demon may have been deployed to the forest, which means that the key is involved, so they'll be sending in combat troops. Meanwhile, inside the barrier, everyone is having fun and just being happy, apart from Kagari, who seems to be acting like a ghost once again because of Gaia's doomsday music. Akani's almost dead grandmother is also with the doomsday choir. She hopes the key can hear them and join in the song of destruction. And yes, 
Kagari can hear them. In the next scene, we see the lizard-faced summoner and his minions standing on the corpses of the Guardian Scout team, pleased with themselves. Meanwhile, Kotaru is still training. However, he is too distracted and doesn't seem to be doing well, so Sakuya calls it a day and leaves to do a sweep of the forest. Kotaru couldn't stop thinking about what happened to Kagari the previous night. He decided to go to the Harvest Fiesta with the girls. They reminded him that it was a bad idea. Although Chihaya was hoping to go, Kotaru promised her that they could go next year with everyone from the club. The group notices that Kagari has been quiet all day, and looking up at the sky, suddenly a loud, shattering noise echoes through the forest. Katori tells them that the barrier has been broken from the outside and Kagari suddenly starts screaming like a deranged girl. At the entrance of the forest, Katori and Kotaru find the lizard-faced summoner Midu. First he sets fire to the forest and then asks if Lucia is dead. He tells them how he skewered and barbecued her the last time. Kotaru gets angry and releases his Wolverine blade, and the summoner summons the ultimate weapon demon he got from Akane. Kotori's Pikachu-looking dog attacked the demon. However, it was like throwing a pebble at a huge mountain, so she summoned her glowing tree demons, but they were completely useless. The rest of the team joins them, and the lizard-faced summoner is disappointed when he sees that Lucia wasn't properly barbecued the last time they fought. Meanwhile, the useless tree demons are crushed by the giant dinosaur demon. Chihaya quickly mounts Lucia on the mammoth dog, and Katori tells everyone to leave the forest because her garbage-made demons will not be able to defend them, and the forest is already toast. Kotaru is shocked when her parents show up guns blazing and with a chainsaw. She grabs him and tries to leave. However, Kotaru refuses. She then tells him that they are just demons, and he agrees to leave. The summoner tries to stop the group with his lava, but Chihaya blocks the attack with a large log of wood. She tells everyone to run. Just then, Katori hears her parents' voice and breaks down, screaming. However, it is too late because they have already jumped into the flames to fight. Meanwhile, Sakuya races back to the forest, praying that Chihaya is safe, but the lizard-faced summoner's minions stop him. They summon a giant crab-looking demon and a giant dragonfly-looking demon. One of the minions calls him Gaia's Apex. Turns out Sakuya is in fact the number one ultimate demon, Apex, that Akane sent to the forest. Too bad the lizard-faced summoner got the number two. Back in the forest, the lizard-faced summoner leaves after finishing up Katori's demon parents. The duo join hands lovingly in their final moment before being barbecued by the fire. Somewhere else, the old knights of Guardian prepare for their final battle. Meanwhile, the nosy teacher Nishikujuo interrogates Shizuru and advises her not to do anything stupid. On their way out of the forest, Katori sadly tells Kotaru that her parents died in a car accident ten years ago. They were the first demons she created after getting her powers. She bursts into tears, remembering what happened. Kotaru apologizes for not knowing what she was going through. Suddenly, a large flame bursts through, separating Kotaru and a zoned-out Kagari from the group. He sees the summoner fanning the demon flames, so he tells the others to go on without them. The summoner told Kotaru that he was only interested in killing him, and not Kagari. Kotaru wondered why this lizard-looking guy was obsessed with him. He brings out his Wolverine blade while the summoner forges a blade from the fire, and the duo starts fighting. The summoner sends a ball of flame toward them. Kotaru quickly pushes Kagari out of the way and gets slightly barbecued. The two puny demons see him being destroyed but decide to be commentators instead of helping. Kotaru gets back up and slices the summoner. Midu quickly summons his ultimate demon, but it gets shot in the head by the old Knights of Guardian who have just arrived. Kotaru remembers all the men from the pop-up bar where he met Asaka. The men are surprised that they can see the key, although she is supposed to be a ghost. However, it just makes killing a whole lot easier. They try to attack her, but the summoner counters their attack. Kotaru is surprised when he tells him to take Kagara and run. As Kotaru leaves, the fight between the Guardians and Midu the lizard-faced summoner becomes even fiercer, but the Guardians overpower and defeat him. Before dying, the lizard-faced summoner, Midu, flashes back to his childhood and how his mother was killed. Back in the present, Midu smiles before being consumed by his own flames. The old knights report the events of the day to Asaka, and he tells them to continue pursuing the key. Outside the surveillance van, Nishikuju reads the letter Shizuru left for her before leaving. Meanwhile, after their escape, Kotaru remembers the summoner telling him that the world would be destroyed if he allowed Kagari to live. He angrily asks her if she is trying to destroy the world. However, Kagari doesn't respond. Kotaru is badly wounded. Fortunately, Shizuru shows up and heals the wound while he passes out. Kotaru wakes to see the girls together waiting for him, and Shizuru has also healed Lucia. Kotaru is surprised to see their location, a Gaian facility called the City of Stone, and Chihaya tells him that it is used as demon storage. The group is worried that Kagari has still not come to her senses. Meanwhile, Akani joins her grandmother, Sakura, in the Doomsday Choir Room. She asks the old woman why she wants to destroy humanity. The old lady tells her that for many generations, the successor's soul and memories have been passed down to the next, and that is what Akani is currently battling with. With each new generation, the bad memories of previous successors are passed down, 
increasing the hatred for humanity. Akani tells her that she has happy memories in her life, and the old woman dares her to resist the order of succession. She tells Akani that Doomsday is already near, and they need to head to the sanctuary to start. In the Stone City, Kotaru watches his friends and wishes that Akani was with them. He calls out to Kagari, but she doesn't answer him. Kotori tells him that this zoned-out Kagari is how she was originally made to be, however Kotaru doesn't believe her. Suddenly Kagari cries and says that she couldn't find any good memories involving humans. Meanwhile, Akani and her grandmother are seen on the roof of Gaia HQ ready for Doomsday. Suddenly an angry board member barges in, asking why Sakura ordered summoners to attack the city. The man is too greedy for money and doesn't want the world to end, so he pulls out his gun to shoot her but a demon attacks and kills him. Next up, the Doomsday Ceremony begins as Sakura summons the key, and a rune appears in the sky. At the Stone City, Kagari begins to scream. Kotaru and the others try to touch her, but her red ribbon swirls around her, preventing them. Chihaya is the only one who also starts hearing the destruction song. Suddenly, a giant tree rises up into the sky, piercing through the rune. Meanwhile, Sakuya is still stuck in the forest, racing to find Chihaya. He stops as giant roots start spreading through the forest. Kotaru and his friends suddenly find themselves back in Kazumatsuri. Kotaru says that someone must have summoned them back. Demons overrun the city and start attacking people, while the forest rapidly starts to encroach. Sakura watches the city in chaos and smiles, pleased with her work. In the final episode, we see a desolate Kazumatsuri and the letter Akani sent to Kotaru, where she wrote about the Song of Destruction and the ceremony for Doomsday. In the letter, she tells him to either kill the key to save mankind or let it live to save the planet. We are never told if he received this letter, but from the last few events, he definitely never saw this letter. Kotaru carries Kagari on his back heading to the top of a high-rise building with Katori closely behind them. A flashback shows Katori almost getting killed by a demon, but her mammoth dog, Chibimoth, jumps in to save her, and gets injured instead. Yoshino and his gang are now on monster vigilante duties. Guardian HQ has been overrun by monsters, but Asaka battles them. Shizuru and Lucia seem to be having a face-off with the nosy teacher Nishikuju. Meanwhile, elsewhere, Sakuya battles with the old knights of Guardian. Akane is seen on the roof, surrounded by the corpse of her grandmother Sakura and other members of Gaia shot with a gun. We also see little Shimako looking at her from the shadows. Meanwhile, Kotaru reaches the top of the building along with Katori, her wounded dog, and the two puny demons, Gil and Pani. We see a flashback to Doomsday, overgrown roots shot through the middle of the city, destroying buildings and everything in their wake. Then the monsters moved in, killing any living thing they could find. The sea flooded, and volcanic eruptions rocked the town. Back in the present, Kotaru tries to wake Kagari up, but suddenly, a gigantic metal-looking demon moves past them. Kotaru immediately recognized that it was Sakuya. Sakuya had overused his powers and completely transformed into Gaia's apex demon. Kagari finally wakes up and asks for her morning coffee. She tells Kotaru that the awful song of doom has stopped. Kotaru quickly hugs her, but they are interrupted by Asaka, who tries to kill Kagari. Kotaru rewrites his abilities ten times more and attacks him, however Asaka is too experienced. Kotaru makes peace with losing his humanity, and continues to increase his speed to match up to him. Meanwhile, Chihaya is sleeping on a now completely demonized Sakuya. The old knights of Guardian are still attacking him, and Sakuya is still trying to protect Chihaya. Back on the high-rise, Asaka tells Kotaru that his attacks are too poor, even though he is fast. He slices through Kotaru's chest, but the bleeding stops immediately. He then tries to finish Kotaru, but Shizuru drives a bike up the building and takes him down with her, and the duo starts fighting each other. Meanwhile, Kotaru's body gives out because he went too far with the rewrite, and his chest starts to grow a tree branch. Kagari weeps, blaming herself for it. She was drawn to him because Kotori put a piece of her ribbon inside his arm. A flashback shows when Katori went into the forest to find the key and found Kotaru fatally wounded there, so she begged Kagari to save him. That was how Kagari's ribbon was embedded in Kotaru's arm. Back in the present Kagari, the stupid tiny demons Gil and Pawnee decided to be useful. Since they already formed a contract with Kotaru before, they can take the place of the ribbon inside him, which ensures that he lives. Kagari finally takes out her ribbon from his body, while the puny demons disappear into him. Kotaru immediately regains consciousness. He asks for the little demons but Katori tells him that they both ran away. Suddenly, Kagari starts screaming as the Song of Destruction starts again for Phase 2 of Doomsday. Human souls in the form of yellow light start rising to the sky, signifying the end of humanity. The overgrown tree branches continue to grow, and Kotaru's arm starts twitching painfully. His arm turns into a tree. Meanwhile, we see that Akani has been completely taken over by the second personality. She starts sounding like a maniac, and recites a doomsday poem showing her hatred for humans. Meanwhile, outside the city, people start disappearing. Akani completes the ceremony and summons Kagari again, 
The poor girl starts screaming, but even louder this time. Kotaru tries to hold her, but the branches on him rapidly grow. Kagari's hair starts spreading like a tree branch, and roots sprout from her feet and start rising into the sky, embedding her from the waist down inside a trunk. Meanwhile, Kotaru is still struggling to get to Kagari on the tree. He finally gets to her and tries to wake her up from the trance, however. The roots of the tree start dragging him down but he doesn't give up. Kotaru mistakenly places his hands on her chest. Kagari instantly stops shouting and uses her ribbon to slap him silly for touching her inappropriately. She is out of her full-on zombie mode and starts to tease him. Kagari looks up to see the damage she has done, and feels bad that she chose to destroy the world. Kotaru tells her that Psycho Kagari did it, not her. She thanked Kotaru for making her time on Earth memorable and introducing her to his friends. She bade a final farewell to him and asked him to save the world. Kotaru is angry because she means that he should kill her. However, he hugs her instead and starts crying because he can't bring himself to hurt her. The duo hugs each other and cries for a bit. Meanwhile, Shizuru is seen in a corner about to disappear. Lucia joins her not wanting her to go alone, and they disappear together. Psycho Akane is still having the time of her life watching the end of the world. She starts laughing uncontrollably. The bodies on the roof also disappear. Shimako walks up to Akane and holds her hands immediately the real Akane resurfaces and they both happily disappear together. Meanwhile, Sakuya has returned to himself. Chihaya picks him up, and they disappear together. Katori says goodbye to Chibimoth, and he turns to dust, shortly after she also disappears. Gradually, everyone in the city starts disappearing, one by one. On the giant tree, Kagari and Kotaru are still holding on to each other. Kotaru wonders if he could save the world if he had more time. Kagari smiles at him, and just then he closes his eyes, and the branches cover his whole face. Shortly after that they are completely buried inside the tree trunk. 